Hey everyone, it's George Kroos and welcome back to another episode of the best of 2021 uh, highlights from the Innovators Mindset podcast. And as I did last week, when I shared this video, I shared like a lesson that I learned. And last week's lesson was kind of a focus on gratitude and why that really matters. And this really leads beautifully into the second one is really focusing on our own well-being. Uh, over this past year, if you've been following the podcast, if you've been following me on Instagram, anywhere, uh, you have seen that I've really kind of focused on taking care of my own physical health and how that's really conducive to my mental health and basically how they kind of offset one another. I think a lot of times we get to a point where we become really negative and uh, it's easy to kind of fall into some bad habits. I know personally, to be honest with you, uh, one of the habits I struggle with is when I'm being really pessimistic, when I'm getting very negative, um, I tend to overeat, right? Uh, eating is a comforting thing for me. And um, I really kind of focus on my well being. And, you know, doing Mindset Monday this past year has been uh, something I really enjoyed as well. And kind of sharing some of the lessons that I have. And I know that we have to continuously um, focus on how we ensure that our workplace, not just in education, but in other places, honors our well being, honors our mental health. But we also have to understand that we could be waiting forever for someone else to do that for us and really kind of looking at not just 2021, but last two years, um, understanding that we can't always count on other people, uh, taking care of our health, but we always can count on ourselves. And that's something I focus on is that what can I do right now? And it doesn't mean that others aren't helpful in this process, but that's something I've learned when I was talking to like educators is really the importance of, you know, our mental well-being, our mental health. And we always talk about, you know, social emotional learning for our students. But uh, as you kind of listen to this podcast throughout the year, we have to be cognizant of our own social emotional well-being as well as of our colleagues as well. And um, taking care of my own mental and physical health has helped me to better help others. Um, and see the importance and really kind of learn some of those boundaries that you have to have in your life, uh, when to say no, um, when we say yes to people. And uh, that's something I learned through this podcast. So that's one of the lessons. The first one was gratitude. Uh, this week was really about talking about well-being. But you'll learn a ton of lessons from these great guests. And I hope you enjoy this podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the highlights from 2021 of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. The moment I went up to that vision board and I had to take something off of my vision board because it had already manifested in my life, folks, <laughs> mm -mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you, folks, it's so powerful. So you need a vision board. The second thing you need to do, you need to get up and George and I've been talking about this offline. You need to get up every morning and you need to journal. Now, I am not an old school uh, paper and pen, paper and pencil kind of journal person. So that does not excite me at all. <laughs> okay. I'm a typer, right? I, I like to uh, I fancy myself as being someone who can type, oh, I say roughly around 60 to 70 words per minute with not that many errors. <laughs> um, but I was a typer. I am a typer, right? So here's, here's a pro tip for y'all, fans of Apple devices. The app is called Day One, D-A-Y-O-N-E. And it is a journaling app. And I use that journaling app myself. I've used it for a long time. I have it on my MacBook Pro, from which I'm talking to you right now. It syncs across my iPad Pro, syncs across my iPhone as well. So no matter where I'm at, no matter what I'm doing, Day One app, is on all of my devices or whatever device is on me at the time. Two really cool things about that app that I really like. If you would say, you know, Vernon, I'm not really experienced in journaling. I'm kind of new to this thing. Uh, what do I write about, right? I just want to get into the practice of writing. One of the things that's neat about day one is it will give you a daily prompt. Like I had a daily prompt one time, what's your favorite music and what about that music moves you? That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. So if you're that kind of person where you've never written before, just use the prompt 
the daily prompt that day one gives you. When I got past the daily prompt, I started getting into uh, some deeper things. I started journaling about things that were going on in my professional life, things that were going on in my personal life. This really became my online diary. Hmm. But here's the other thing that I did, and I journal and I do that every single day. The other thing that I do, and again, I'm not going to reveal all of them, uh, but I'm definitely going to drop some pro tips here. One of the other things that I do every single morning, folks, some of you may laugh, but I'm going to say to you this, it's been working over and over and over in my life. I have a list of affirmations and I read those affirmations aloud to myself every morning, every single morning. You may say, well, Vernon, what does that mean? I have an affirmation that says I am a person that does da, 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 da. And I specifically talk about whatever the action is, who the action benefits, and how it benefits that person. That's a specific thing. And I, that's just one affirmation, right? And I read that list of affirmations every single morning. Now, some of you that follow me deeply, you know that, that uh, on my IG profile and on my Twitter profile and on Clubhouse and some other spaces, I have the initials NLP, which stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. So I'm a certified Neuro Linguistic Programming coach. NLP is, is called shorthand. And that just kind of works on how we get the mind to process and work very efficiently. And one of the things that we talk a lot about in NLP is the power of you hearing yourself say something. Now, I know that's deep. I don't mean to get esoteric. I don't pretend to be this person that understands everything on this metaphysical deep level, right? But when you hear yourself, when your inner ear and your outer ear, when they come together and they hear you saying that about yourself, something powerful works, folks. I can't remember the quote, but it's like intelligence is like is shown in your ability to change. Right into like into like change the way you think. I can't remember what it was. There's there's some quote about that, but what, while I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about like really kind of that that, empath, that the importance of empathy. I did this. Uh, there, uh, one of my favorite books of all time is uh, Seven Habits. Uh, Covey and I reference Covey stuff all the time, mm -hmm. and he tells a story about being. I can't remember if it was him or it was like a story he had heard but a basically being like on a subway and there is like a dad and his kids were just like running roughshod over the place and just being super annoying and horrible. And Cubby's like, this is the worst dad ever. Like this, like, can you like not get your kids under control? And so he says something to the dad and the dad says, Oh, like, I'm really sorry. Uh, our, their mom just died and I didn't know how to deal with it. And it just changes perspective. Right. Cause like, he sees a bad parent, but he doesn't see that here's a person who doesn't know how to deal with what's going on because they've just endured a significant loss and trying to figure out how they're moving forward with their children. Right. But we don't like, we don't necessarily seek that story out. Right. We just kind of paint and, and have this connection. And yeah, so I think it's it back to like understanding our brain. That's why I've loved like I've, that the part of my seat as part of my season this year, I'm mm -hmm. going to be looking at a book called Cogn cognitive neuroscience. And it's all about neuroscience. I don't know a lot about neuroscience. Mm -hmm. I'm just like learning as I go. And I want to break down the different parts of this book because I want to really, really understand for myself. Again, it's me understanding it, but then helping other people understand what's going on in our brain naturally wants to catastrophize everything. Like it, like it, mm -hmm. it, it goes there, like our part of our brain that tries to like see it and then jump to a conclusion that that's a part of it. And from what I've seen so far, like in the research and that our brain doing that, it's not bad for us to do that. But then we have to think, is that the truth? Our brain thinks mm -hmm. that and then critical critical thinking about what we're thinking. Like it is very meta metacog metacognition, but it's it, we need to do it. We need a question, is that the truth of what we think is the truth? Mm -hmm. You know, like that's actually really important is we can jump to the conclusion because our brain might naturally do that, but then we have to think, is that actually is that conclusion right? Is that conclusion correct and what we're actually jumping to? And then if it's not, or what could be going on instead, like exactly that person. And I, I'm not saying I don't do it. Like, of course, of course I do it. Of course, like my brain naturally does it, but I'm getting better at catching the thought. Like, so it's, it's catching the thought, 
credit challenging it and then creating a new thought if you feel like you have to. Mm-hmm. And that's actually using psychology for people with like depression, things like that, CBT like, training. Mm-hmm. But we can do it in our own thinking as well, catching the thought that we have, challenging it. Is it, do we think it's correct? Do we actually think that? Or is that something that we're assuming because of our biases, because of all these different mm-hmm. things? And then creating a new thought or saying, no, that, that is something I want to hold to myself. And that's what I want to do. So it's, it's okay to have those initial thoughts, but actually what we do with those thoughts are really important. Do we post them straight away or do we say something about them? Do we do act on it straight away or do, like you said, take a step back and think about what we can do with them? You said this, you know, you said this, um, I read this from you, is that you talked about this notion of like the conventional happiness formula is, is wrong. Mm-hmm. What, what do you mean by that? So there's this formula for happiness that we've all grown up with and been led to believe is the true path. And that path is, um, you know, to go to college and get a degree Mm -hmm. and hopefully you choose a job where you make a lot of money um, and then you get that job and you climb the corporate ladder or you work harder and you put more hours in so you get the recognition so you can get a promotion or you can buy the 5,000 square foot home or you can have the brand new you know, SUV. And so you work hard, you put your head to the grindstone, you work your way up the ladder, you hopefully you create more wealth and with more wealth, you get more things in your life. And then at the other end of that formula, you finally have arrived at success, right? You've gotten married, you've had the 2.5 kids, you've got the dog, you've got the nice home, you've got the nice car. And so that's the formula that we've all been fed. What we know from the last 10 to 15 years of research straight out of Harvard University, Sean Aker's work, as well as um, the University of Pennsylvania with Martin Seligman, is that that formula is actually completely backwards. We actually know that when you put your well-being at the forefront, you change every single business, education, and organizational outcome. And here's why, here's why, George, when you're talking about you're, you know, you're talking about a brain, right? So we know that a positive brain is 31% more productive than a brain at negative, neutral, or stressed. And this comes straight from Sean Aker. So when we're thinking about, you know, you're wanting your people to be open-minded and ready to come up with creative solutions to their problems and expand their awareness of how they can use technology. But if the people within the building, if their brains are mostly at negative, neutral, or stressed, they're losing productivity. You know, we also know that a positive brain is going to be three times more creative, which means it's gonna be able to come up with solutions that it previously couldn't come up with because it was so overrun with the stress and the negativity. We know that a positive brain is 10 times more engaged in their job and in their life. And so this is kind of why happiness and well-being are are coming to the forefront because Fortune 500 companies and even a lot of schools that I work with now, they're seeing the research that says, hey, when I put my employee well-being at the forefront, I actually I actually get better, more engaged, more motivated, more open-minded, more solution-oriented employees who are showing up for work and for kids, and they feel a lot better, not just in their work life, but in their home life. See, we're three part beings, right? Mind, body, and spirit. And so usually when we're having difficulties focusing, it's because biologically we have um, a lot of adrenaline that keeps our mind racing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So also there's a comparison between people that are highly organized and structured. The sounds that best suit them are like soft jazz music, um, music that has melodies that you can follow. And for people that are on the go that uh, have schedules that are more flexible, that that are not as so highly structured, sounds that don't have uh, direct rhythms Mm -hmm. and um, melodies to follow can help them decrease some of that anxiety. With the sound bowls, what's happening, there's there's seven bowls and they are correlated to the seven energy centers in the bottom uh, of the body. And so every time the bowl is strummed, it releases a frequency that you hear that kind of just moves around the internal body chemistry and gets those hormones that are not regulated or not uh, balanced due to trauma in -hmm. the body to start pumping and going. So what you'll find is that 
the longer that you're able to meditate or listen to these sound healings, naturally the the adrenaline, all of the other hormones that have built up that, that are toxic in your body will start to lower. Your blood pressure will start to lower because your body's naturally producing what it needs to produce. When we're in um, traumatic situations or, or uh, hurried situations, we're producing a lot of adrenaline mm -hmm. in our body and, and high levels of that over time pushes us through situations that sometimes we can't think through all the way. Mm -hmm. Our body responds before our brain does. And so when you're able to kind of regulate those emotions and, and calm down, you're able to make better decisions for higher emotional payoff. But it takes practice. I was the same right. way. And now when I put on the headphones and listen to um, like binaural beats, mm -hmm. which is beats that have conflicting sounds to help um, regulate the you know, the hemispheres in your brain so mm -hmm. it helps for deeper states of meditation now honestly it feels like heaven when i hear it because right. it's just um just a release have you seen those videos of people the asmr like yeah yeah. Whispering in? yeah it's it's sort of doing the same thing because we're in a society with so much energy and so much um on the go right and so when you have to calm yourself down to focus and listen. Yeah, it's releasing those hormones and helping regulate your emotions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna like start a paid podcast listening because I feel like I'm yeah. getting, I'm getting some gold right now. Because like, yeah, actually, I mean, yeah, I love it. Seriously, and then, and I know people listening to this. So okay, so just I want to try to understand this a little bit deeper. So yeah, it's not, it's not just like this sound will work for everybody. It's actually kind of identifying some of the ways that you are and kind of identifying some of those different. Is that is that my yeah. understand that correctly? Because that, that to yes. me, like, you know, I just, I think a lot of times it's, um, I, like, if I get a massage, it's like, mm -hmm. this music's not doing anything. It's actually making me more anxious sometimes, right? And maybe it's yeah. kind of just how yeah. I'm wired a little bit. Is that, am I reading yeah. that right? It could be, right? You got to mm -hmm. find what works for you. Mm -hmm. But then also, there's a number of things, right? When you set yourself down for meditation, um, sometimes people feel guilty. There's a number of thoughts that goes through their head, like, is this really working? Do I even have time for this? So they don't even mm -hmm. gift themselves right. the time of silence, mm -hmm. of just not move, not moving, um, relaxing your brain. And so when you get into those, those, that space of just letting what comes to you and observe your thoughts, right? Observe what's happening so that you can make better decisions. Um, it prepares you. It, it, it makes you able to regulate yourself in difficult situations and so that you're taking what you're practicing and you can apply it to real life, right? Life is supposed to be a walking meditation if you think about it. You're supposed to always be aware of what's happening, what's happening to yourself mm -hmm. so that when you're encountering something, you get to choose if you want to experience it or not. We don't have to experience everything that comes right. into our face, right? But the problem is, People get so triggered by what's in front of them right. because of a biological response mm -hmm. that's inside of them. Think about, I don't know, think about a situation that happened to you that caused some sort of trauma that, you know, you'll have a trigger to, mm -hmm. right? It's stored in your body. Mm -hmm. All of that, all of that energy, all of the hormones, the built up hormone levels are stored. So when you have a similar trigger that you encounter, your body will respond faster than your brain will, unless you put yourself in different environments to get what you need naturally. And so when you talk about like some of the things that you focused on, how has that like helped you in the classroom? Like what, what has that actually done? Because I think a lot of times, uh, you know, people see all the stuff that you share, but like, mm -hmm. how does it actually like improve learning in your classroom? How does it help students, yeah. the ones you work with every single day? Totally. I think this is key. So I think, you know, there's been a really big push with social emotional learning in the mm -hmm. classroom. And the whole idea behind it is, can we regulate our emotions? Can we get to a place where children come out of our school system being able to be, you know, highly functioning adults, like having a good sense of their understanding of themselves and their emotions and their, their uh, interactions with one another, their thinking, all of that, really being metacognitive about their, their approach with each other and then their, old, their own self-concept. The irony, however, is that many educators uh, have a hard time with mm -hmm. a lot of the skills in there. Not that we're not experienced, it's just 
to dig into that self-knowledge, to dig into who we really are, our goals, our dreams, our what makes us feel happy, all those self-care mm -hmm. practices, those are things that in fact, we need to be practicing ourselves and we don't always. And so I think a lot of the work that I've been doing in the last, you know, four or five years has been around how do I take care of myself, not just with meditation and, mm -hmm. and self-care, but also like craft the life that I want to be leading, set goals that are really ambitious and in tune with my values. How do I do those things in such a way that when I'm living a really wholehearted life where I feel proud of where I'm going and I feel proud of the trail that I'm leaving behind, that I, that energy comes off in the classroom, that I'm able to, through example, mm -hmm. tell my students, you can be an author. You know, I right. see these kids who have limitless energy, beautiful, you know, creativity. You give them one little spark of an idea and off they go in, in so many direct, like really amazing skills. And to be able to sit there and really tell them with conviction, you know, you can actually do something with this. And you may not see it right now. Your parents may not see it right now because maybe it's a lot. Mm -hmm. But you have so much creativity in you that you can do something with this. And so I think being able to follow, follow that calling or that little voice inside that says you can do something that maybe seems insurmountable or seems kind of a bit of a stretch if you yourself do mm -hmm. that, it's like growth mindset, you're able to trickle that down to the kids and then they can actually see themselves in in the light that you, you know, the light that you shine on them. And I think that's really what this is about. I love this quote from Michael Jordan. And I'll tell you, one of the things I've watched, um, I do some runs, we have a treadmill and uh, uh, I do runs and I do a long run once a week and I watch The Last Dance and I've watched it probably like five times over. I watch it. It's just a motivating thing with me while I run, just easier to do. And I love this quote um, from Michael Jordan. He says, I always set short-term goals. As I look back, each one of the steps or successes led to the next one. And really just kind of seeing like how do those successes, how do those things, you know, kind of kind of connect. And so really thinking kind of the habits, systems and goals and things like that. What does that actually look like? So I, I kind of broke this down on on what does this look like? So I have these daily habits that I do. I have some weekly goals. I have some medium goals and then I have my long term goals and the habits really lead into the goals. So, for example, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the habits have to do a lot with my eating. The routines, things like that have been really helpful. But also step goals are really important. And like, for example, I set a, a, a number for how many steps I'm going to get every day during that week before I finish exercising. And that's a habit that I have every single day. When I eat, how I eat, when I eat, that's a habit I have every single day. And those habits lead into the goals. Uh, one of the things that I've done and I saw as a good practice is actually um, weighing yourself every day. And I read that somewhere. And again, worked for me, might not work for you, but that was really helpful for me just to kind of see how I was doing. Now, I, I told you earlier that I don't actually, um, the one day I, I eat poorly is on Friday and I have something that is like Saturday. I do not weigh myself because I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to take that away from me. I, I, I like having that one good meal and, and, you know, growing up in a restaurant, food is a big part of our lives and I enjoy it. And so, but here's the other part of this too. One of the habits that was really helpful for me, I don't eat anything I dislike. I actually enjoy every meal that I have and kind of finding foods that worked within my goals and worked within what I was doing was really important. Uh, I'm not eating like just tons of broccoli every single day, but I do have vegetables every day and I have chicken and I have things like that. So those daily habits have been really helpful. The, the second thing is like now, what do the habits lead to? Where is the accountability to what these habits are leading to? So my short-term goals, and these are weekly goals, is I try to actually um, lose two to three pounds a week. And that goal for when you're in weight loss is typically seen as, as a reasonable goal. If you're trying to lose like five to 10 pounds, it's probably going to be water weight. Like I said, not a doctor, but that is not sustainable uh, for long periods of time. And again, it depends where you are in your journey. Uh, but two pounds is like um, kind of a probably the safer way. Um, could be one pound, could be two pounds, three pounds is kind of a max. And just kind of what I would do is that I would set out those goals 
And I wouldn't weigh myself. I, I mentioned I, I weigh myself daily, but I don't weigh myself multiple times daily. It's just when I wake up, see, you know what I weigh. And, you know, maybe kind of give me an indicator of like how maybe something I ate affected me, things like that. But I would once a week on Monday, write down what my weight was and I would write it down, uh, you know, and I would kind of see those two to three goals. And so that's a good way for me to kind of actually go into those like short term goals. Like what, what am I trying to do? And seeing, you know, as those goals stack, how do they get to the big goals? Instead of just thinking about like having a short term and then a big goal, I kind of also did like a medium goal. So um, I would use this scale and the scale is connected to your phone. Like everything, you can get a fridge to connect to your phone, uh, but the scale could connect to your phone and I could track my weight. But instead of actually tracking my weight every day on that scale, kind of going through the ups and downs, I had that chart for the, you know, once a week weigh in. But then um, every, the first of each month, I would actually see, uh, I would measure how much I've weighed. And so since August, I've basically lost between 8 to 10 to 12 max uh, pounds per month. And so sometimes when you're getting frustrated, that's a good thing for me to look at, kind of seeing like, hey, you you know, maybe you haven't had as good a week as you wanted, but you can kind of take a look at like, hey, you've 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 had, you know, big chunks through that process. And so that short term goal helps to get to that medium goal, which then leads to the big goal, which, you know, I hit this week. And kind of what I did, and I think uh, Vernon Wright, you know, I've caught contact, he's big on vision boards, a lot of people, I, I wrote that goal down. And I, I put it as like, when I say this, it's, it's not my big goal, it's not the end game, but it's my big goal for now. And once I hit it, I readjusted, I've now set a different big goal, but it's not as, you know, far from where I, I want to go. But having that and just seeing that each day and kind of like seeing how I'm getting closer and closer and closer. So just to kind of recap, having those habits and going through that process, but then having the small, medium and long-term goals and like the measures, like how do I see that I'm making progress? Because I think when I was doing this before and I was like working out, I didn't have any measure. I maybe some ha had some good habits, but I had no measure. But once I said, okay, do these habits work and what are the measures to show you? Um, that was really helpful to me. And like I said, not just with weight loss, it can be in other facets of your life. And honestly, I've applied these, these things um, to other aspects of my life. For example, I blog once a week. Well, those once a week blogs have led to a couple of books. And so those times, and you know, I'm, I'm currently working on my third book and, and, you know, the habit of writing has kind of led me to, to doing this. And then, you know, when I get to that book part, then I set goals of what I want to try to write in a day. And so those, those things have really connected. One of the things that Katie and I talked about is just the initiative overload in education. Mm -hmm. There's so much thrown at teachers. And wouldn't it be nice if they had frameworks that will be helpful for the life of their career and also frameworks that help them to navigate what is an evolving educational landscape, mm -hmm. right? So sure, the pandemic was awful. It had this um, big disruption on education. But that's, there's no guarantees we couldn't end up in a similar situation in six months and a year. And so as Katie and I worked together, it was like, here are these principles and kind of tenets of universal design that are so important, but they can be a little daunting to implement mm -hmm. generally. And then also as teachers are kind of navigating this very fluid situation where they're online, they're in class, they're a blend of the two. So how do we help them understand how to take these universal design principles and these tenants and actualize them using these different models, which from my perspective, and it was so exciting working, working with Katie, because I'm like, I'm all about that teacher realizing that our value isn't in our subject area expertise. Mm -hmm. It's not us at the front of a physical or virtual room. It's us 
connecting with learners. It is that human side of teaching that is so critical and we need to lean on these models in order to have more opportunities to connect with individual learners, small groups of learners, give them meaningful choices within the design and the facilitation of these learning experiences. So it was just this really beautiful complement of, you know, anybody who learns about universal design, I mean, you can't argue with how valuable that is. I think it's just mm -hmm. how do we implement it in a way that feels sustainable given all of the demands on teachers and this kind of changing landscape that we're in. Katie, you got what do you got to add to that? Yeah, and I think another thing too is that, you know, UDL at, at its core is, you know, right now people are designing learning experiences. Everyone mm -hmm. is designing learning experiences, but we're not providing students with equally relevant or valuable opportunities to learn. Mm -hmm. And that is because the way that we're designing wasn't, you know, it's not flexible enough to meet the needs of everyone. So, you know, are we looking for, I think that like there's this friction of talking about like, does this mean everyone's gonna have the same exact outcomes? Right. No, because we know about human variability. And, you know, there will always be people who are stronger at writing and there'll always be people who are taller and they'll always, you know, there is variability, but we shouldn't be able to predict outcomes mm -hmm. based on identity of students. Is that like, we wanna give equal opportunities to access instruction that is rigorous, instruction that allows students to learn and share what they know. Um, and then we'll have, you know, equal opportunities, equal access will result in higher levels of learning. But I think that some people want to throw this out because it's like, oh, there's never going to be a time that every single student performs in the same exact right. way. Well, that is correct because we are not right. robots. And so I think that understanding variability and knowing that when students don't have really solid, rigorous opportunities to learn, right. it's often because it just simply is not flexible enough. And when we can name those barriers and we can say, you know what, like we can actually design these differently, then more students will learn. So one like really generic example is um, you could say I'm a strong reader, you could label me as a strong reader, but that is only when you give me text in English. And that is only when I'm wearing corrective lenses because I can't see without contact right. or glasses. Those just happen to be two things that are always provided to students. And so it's not that I'm a stronger reader. It's like the, the tools that I need are accepted in classrooms. Mm -hmm. And you know what we find with universal design is if a student, for instance, is not reading at grade level, the answer is not just give them a really easy text. It's do they need an audio version? Do they need to read it with a partner? Do we need to pre-teach vocabulary? And so I love the framework because it's thinking about what really are the barriers that students are facing and how can we eliminate those through design? But knowing that so many students are different, pulling small groups really is the answer. And we cannot give every kid what they need when we are meeting or facing 45 kids in a classroom mm -hmm. um, because they don't all need a printed book in English, you know, that, that they right. can they can see. So I think that if we want to meet the needs of all students, we need to leverage um, instructional design that is not only flexible enough for students to get what they need, but flexible enough to give us time with individual kids and small groups to build those relationships and help them to recognize these are the tools that you need to advocate mm -hmm. for in your learning so you can be successful.